The next electronic device that we're going to talk about is the operational amplifier. The operational amplifier is a very versatile component and is frequently used for uh, signal measurements and signal conditioning. And we'll talk about some of the uh, different uses for it. Um, but right now we're going to talk about the basics and the operational amplifier is an active circuit component. So this active circuit component here um, means or indicates that uh, the op amp requires power in order to operate. This is unlike um, the resistive elements that we've been talking about to date and is unlike the capacitor and the inductor which we'll talk about uh, in the coming weeks. Um, the active circuit component requires that it, it uh, be provided with a voltage supply or a power supply in order to do the things that it needs to do. So um, in a common op amp symbol is this triangular symbol right here and it has uh, three, in, uh, three terminals that are very important as well as the voltage supply terminal. So uh, two of the terminals on this indicated on this schematic right here um, are the positive supply voltage and the negative supply voltage and the other um, two inputs that are important are the non-inverting input which is indicated on the symbol by a plus sign but it's very important that we do not call that the positive input. There's, uh, there's only a non-inverting input and an inverting input. So um, these are the two input terminals to the device and then there's an output terminal and we'll talk about the relationship between the inputs and the outputs as we move along here. Um, because it's implied that uh, the op amp is an active circuit we know that we need a voltage supply um, to operate it so it's very common to drop the supply uh, inputs uh, from the symbol uh, and just focus on the non-inverting, the inverting, and the output. Uh, again, that's because it's implied that we need power for this to operate. Um, the operational amplifier is a DC coupled high gain differential input voltage amplifier and I know that's a big mouthful. We're going to talk about what each of these components mean but um, basically a DC coupled means that it will accept DC signals and that's a good thing because right now we're only working with uh, or we're primarily working with DC signals. High gain means um, that there is uh, is going to be a very large multiplicative factor in here somewhere and a differential input voltage amplifier means it's going to take the difference between the potential or the voltage uh, across the input terminals. So um, basically we can take a DC signal at either of the input terminals we're going to take the difference between the voltage at the two input terminals and we're going to multiply that voltage by a uh, very large number and we're going to output a voltage that it corresponds to that difference multiplied by this high gain factor. So how does an op amp work? Well here's the schematic. Um, this is a schematic that represents the internal workings of the semiconductor um, materials uh, inside. So I guess what we could do is we could uh, start drawing some band diagrams and figure out how this works, right? I know you're very excited for that. Um, but unfortunately this is a very complicated device which has a lot of field effect transistors, capacitors, inductors, and resistive elements uh, uh, sort of embedded inside of the semiconductor materials and that are all interconnected in a way to make the op amp operate. Um, thankfully we have an abstraction model for the op amp. So instead of worrying about how all of the transistors are biased and, and turn on and allow um, current and uh, potential to develop across their terminals, what we can do is we can abstract the model, um, we can take that complicated circuit diagram and we can say, we can pretend that it behaves like this. So the abstraction model for an op amp is that we're going to take the non-inverting terminal and the inverting terminal and those two terminals are connected with a resistive element which is Ri. And then the output terminal is simply a dependent voltage source that uh, is connected through a resistor and that dependent voltage source is going to provide an output voltage that is proportional to the difference between the potentials uh, across this resistor right here uh, across the input terminals and we're going to multiply that by a very large gain factor A. Alright, so typical op amps uh, that we are going to work with and that we'll most likely encounter are going to have gains between 20,000 and 200,000 volts per volt. So for every volt 
of potential difference developed across the input terminals here, across this input resistor, we're going to multiply that difference by 20,000 or 200,000 and provide a voltage output uh, that is, uh, is much larger, uh, that's multiplied by that factor. So if there's one volt of input across, this, uh, across the inverting and non-inverting terminals, then um, the output voltage, in theory, would be uh, 20,000 to 200,000 volts. Now, of course, we're going to uh, see some limitations with that. Before we do that, though, uh, what we're going to use in this class is the ideal op-amp model. So we're going to simplify the op-amp model even further, and we're going to use the ideal op-amp model that assumes that there is no resistance, uh, excuse me, there's an infinite resistance between the input terminals. So you see the difference here. The input resistance here is finite for the abstraction model, and we're going to assume that there's an infinite impedance. There's no um, there's no resistance between the input terminals, which means there's no current that will pass through um, between the input terminals. The other assumption that we're going to make is that there's no output resistance. All right, so there's a re um, no resistive element here. So in theory, that means that uh, the op amp uh, could supply an infinite amount of current. Um, that's not necessarily true. We're going to run into limitations with that, but the ideal op amp model will hold uh, for a large number of cases. And finally, we're going to make the assumption that instead of this gain factor here being a uh, large number between 20 and 200,000 volts per volt, we're going to assume that it's infinite. All right, and of course we know that that's not a very realistic assumption either, um, but we are going to uh, we're going to assume that it's very very large, and uh, that will allow us to um, abstract and describe the uh, behavior of op amps of real op amps uh, fairly well. Of course, some of the limitations are those that I just described. So the zero input impedance implies that, um, or excuse me, the zero output impedance right here, no resistive element here, implies that the um, op amp can provide an infinite amount of current, and that's not true. Uh, most op amps are going to be limited to the amount of current uh, that they can supply. Excuse me, all op amps are going to be limited to the amount of current that they can supply. So they are going to have some finite output resistance to them. Um, the input impedance being infinite implies that there's no current draw um, into the pins, into the input pins. Um, and this actually turns out not to be true. There will be some small amount of current that has to move uh, between, that has to go into the op amp from the input terminals. Um, this is not really a concern except for high gain applications, which we will uh, talk about. Um, but for the most part, this is not going to adversely affect our, um, our modeling using this ideal op amp model. And um, these bias currents can result in some output offsets, and uh, we may be able to discuss uh, how we can counter that as well. Okay, so um, again, the ideal op amp or an op amp is an uh, going to provide a high gain output. It's going to take the difference between the non-inverting and the inverting input terminals and multiply that by a very large number. So again, in this case, if we supply, say, a one volt potential difference between the uh, non-inverting and the inverting terminal, and we're supplying this with a five volt and a negative five volt supply, we would expect that we're going to take that one volt and multiply it by a very large number. And according to the um, According to the ideal op amp model, we're going to multiply that number by infinity. So this means that in this case, a one volt potential is going to be amplified to a nearly infinite output voltage. That doesn't really make much sense now, does it? So we have to talk about this limitation on the high gain output. And the high gain output restriction is that um, because op amps are active devices, they need external power to operate. So the output of a uh, op amp is typically restricted to be less than or equal to the supply voltage range. Um, so uh, if we take a look back here, in this case, even though the ideal op amp model says that we should have a nearly infinite output voltage here, since there is a difference of a positive one volt here, it's going to try to amplify it as much as possible, but the m maximum extent that it can amplify the output voltage to is positive five volts. Um, if there were a negative potential difference uh, between the uh, non-inverting and inverting terminal, 
it would uh, amplify the voltage to the extent of the negative supply and it could go down to negative 5 volts. Okay, but again, we're limited, uh, we're restricted to being less than or equal to the supply voltage range. Um, and uh, when we, when the input or output voltage uh, can be within a few millivolts of the supply voltages, in the previous example that would be plus 5 and negative 5, they're called rail-to-rail op-amps. So there are some operational amplifiers, depending upon the manufacturer and the model number of the op-amp, that are rail-to-rail that will go all the way to the extents of the supply voltage and some that are not rail to rail. So we have to look at our uh, specification sheets to understand uh, how those operate. Now this high gain output restriction forms the basis of an op-amp circuit that we call a comparator. And we'll talk about how the comparator works in the next video.